the uh, that what is hijama and what is the mechanism of hijama um, hijama is actually uh, an arabic word it is uh, derived from the root word of hajam ha jim and meem these are the arabic alphabets hijama was also mentioned in hadith uh, the, the, the sayings of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, in different authentic books of uh, hadith animal horn was used for the purpose of making a suction device hijama is a very old very ancient mode of treatment uh, which is very famous worldwide as a chinese cupping therapy so i also want to know that what kind of the cupping therapies are prevalent in the world uh, famous ones are the wet cupping therapy which is hijama in dry cupping therapy blood is not drawn only the suction is applied in the form of cups and sometimes the suction is applied uh, through fire not uh, using the vacuum the dry cupping therapy only creates a massage like effect it only okay. stimulates the uh, tissues it it right. only uh, improves the blood circulation but it does not removes the clotted blood uh, present between these two layers and it's not coming from the veins or the blood vessels or capillaries because blood capillaries are not present in the topmost layer of the skin hijama cupping therapy has more benefits you highlight the benefits of um, hijama alhamdulillah benefits from hijama almost every type of disease like uh, from cancers and tumors there are the goals are different in some cases uh, the goal is remission palliative care sometimes the goal is supportive therapy sometimes we are uh, countering the side effects of chemotherapy okay. and thus the gap between these uh, three sessions should be one week okay one week so if a person uh, receives hijama therapy three times uh, once a week. Uh, how much you have evaluated that what kind of the people um are not suitable for hijama there are uh, almost all kinds of patients can go through hijama but there is there is a very small number of population it exists that uh, these people should not go for hijama uh, first of all the population of uh, in the case of females the pregnant ladies cannot go through hijama right. Assalamualaikum. Uh, this is Munazza Khan, and I welcome you in our new session regarding hijama and hijama cupping therapy and its ba- health benefits. Today we have uh, Dr. Bilal, who has his expertise on uh, hijama cupping therapy. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Bilal to introduce himself and to please highlight us about his educational background, because as far as I know, you are the first one who had done his PhD thesis. on hijama so sir please start with your introduction thank you very much uh, first of all for inviting me to today's podcast and uh, my name is mohammad bilal i have done my phd in the uh, department from the department of pharmacology university of karachi and my research topic was evaluation of therapeutic effectiveness of hijama or cupping therapy in the treatment of various disorders and uh, before that i was teaching in university of karachi in the department of pharmacology faculty of pharmacy and my primary field was teaching my primary job was teaching uh, my interest was in islamic medicine or the medicines recommended by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this this field is now known as prophetic medicine and uh, in these medicines you know that honey is very famous uh, black seeds are very famous so in this in the in the same sense hijama was also mentioned in hadith uh, the, the sayings of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, in different authentic books of uh, hadith so i was interested in uh, learning about it that what is this uh, mode of treatment uh, about which prophet has said that this is the best of this is the uh, best treatment among all of the other treatments so i was um, uh, looking for it and i was uh, searching for the results but i could not find any um, authentic researches uh, at that time and i am talking about 2008 and 2009 when i was doing my literature search for my um, m form uh, thesis so uh, at that time i found out that uh, hijama is also one of the prophetic medicines or the medicine or therapy recommended by by the, by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i uh, chose this topic i selected this topic because um, i wanted to know about it and i wanted to know if it's if therapeutic effectiveness whether it's effective or not so i selected this topic first time for my m form thesis and then uh, because we know Uh, we uh, we have one year of uh, course work and one year of research work in m form so i uh, performed uh, hijama on 25 uh, healthy individuals and then we tested the blood composition 
of uh, blood acquired through the technique of hijama and we uh, tested almost 21 uh, biochemical parameters uh, in it and then we compared the results with the uh, venous blood samples of the same patients uh, which we acquired at the same time uh, and then we compared the results uh, performed statistical analysis and we found out that uh, there is highly statistically significant difference between the composition of both of the bloods which were obtained from the same individual at the same time so uh, the first thing which was established uh, that hijama the blood which is uh, acquired or uh, which is uh, drawn through the technique of hijama is different in composition uh, as compared to the blood which is drawn through the through the normal uh, veiny section or through the normal uh, blood drawing techniques so uh, this this was the first milestone okay so um, from a layman perspective um I want to know that what is hijama, and uh, please, uh, as you have also mentioned about the historical background of hijama, but can you please um, tell us about the uh, that what is hijama and what is the mechanism of hijama? Um, hijama is actually uh, an Arabic word. It is uh, derived from the root word of hajam, ha, jim, and mim. These are the Arabic alphabets. So it, it is uh, this uh, root word means to suck. the the literal meaning of uh, hijama is to suck or hajam is to suck so it was actually the technique which was used uh, from centuries hijama is a very old very ancient mode of treatment so the technique which was used in those olden uh, ancient days was to use the animals horns animal horn was used for the purpose of um, uh, making a suction device like uh, in the current in uh, nowadays we use suction cups vacuum cups but in those days there were no cups available so instead they uh, they used horns of animals which are hollow from the inside they place the broad area of the horn on the skin of the uh, or the body and the uh, from the tip of the horn they made a very tiny hole and through that hole the copper used to suck the blood it was actually uh, the uh, the distance of the horn was the the length of the horn was actually the distance uh, from the uh, from the site of blood uh, the site of blood and and the mouth of the sucker so th this was the safety only that uh, that was available at that time but uh, the literal meaning of hijama is to suck then it means that to uh, give in small incisions with uh, with the help of any sharp object and after that uh, the blood is drawn through the process of suction so this was the method which was used to draw blood at, the, at that time uh, for the procedure of hijama this is uh, this is an arabic word but uh, we know that hijama is not only uh, um, not only prevalent prevalent in the arabic world but it is uh, the history of hijama Uh, spans throughout the uh, world, and we have seen historical um, uh, uh, historical uh, evidences that hijama was being practiced uh, in 2000 BC uh, in China because in China there was a book. Yes, actually, I want to ask the same thing as well. That what, how many types of the cupping therapies are there in the world? Mm -hmm. And as you have mentioned, that the uh, it, hijama is also one of the ancient ones. So one. uh one cupping therapy that we know or uh, which is very famous worldwide is the chinese cupping therapy so i also want to know that what kind of the cupping therapies are prevalent in the world currently or uh, you find the historical uh, evidences of those cupping therapies right actually there are uh, numerous types of cupping therapies which are being practiced throughout the world and one of them very very um Uh, famous ones are the wet cupping therapy which is hijama yes. uh, like uh, in which the blood is drawn uh, when, uh, while there are uh, other types of therapies also cupping therapies like uh, dry cupping therapy in dry cupping therapy blood is not drawn only the suction is applied in the form of cups and sometimes the suction is applied uh, through fire not uh, using the vacuum but using fire actually uh we know that whenever fire burns it consumes the oxygen around it so uh, in order to achieve that um, the the procedure is that some burning object is inserted in a glass and that glass or that glass cup is inverted and placed over the skin of the patient and uh, the fire inside burns and it consumes all of the oxygen available and when the oxygen is uh, finished or um, it is actually uh, drawn out so 
a vacuum is created and the same type of suction is um, is is there whenever when when we see and it, it happens instantly it does not take long time it uh, it takes so a fraction of a second so what is the difference between the hijama and the uh, or this kind of decupping therapy matlab uh, i want to know that which one is more beneficial the wet cupping therapy or this dry cupping therapy the uh, wet cupping therapy is far more beneficial as compared to the dry cupping therapy because the dry cupping therapy only creates a massage like effect it only okay. stimulates the uh, tissues it it right. only uh, improves the blood circulation but it does not removes the clotted blood which is present uh, underneath the skin the surface uh, like the um, superficial layer of the skin there are three main layers of the skin so the blood which we draw through the technique of hijama is actually uh present between these two layers and it's not coming from the veins or the blood vessels or capillaries because blood capillaries are not present in the topmost layer of the skin so uh, hijama removes that stagnant and toxin containing blood which is present beneath the first layer of the skin and while the dry cupping therapy does not uh, takes it out or does not removes that blood from that uh, portion it only uh, enhances the blood circulation in that area but the main uh, problematic uh, toxins uh, are still they remain there so um, in this way actually we can say that hijama cupping therapy has more benefits so yes. can you highlight the benefits of um, hijama 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 the main mechanism of action of hijama which i have guessed through my research throughout these years like i have been practicing hijama since uh, 2009 or 10 or regularly uh, when i established this clinic i i am i have been practicing since 2013 and i have uh, conducted uh, this procedure over uh, almost um, i mean the number of patients which are registered with our clinic are is more than 40000 oh, and that's remarkable yeah and the number of sessions which have been performed at our clinic is more than 400000 because okay. uh, on an average 10 sessions are have been performed uh, on each patient so we have performed almost around uh, more than 400000 sessions so uh, we have seen uh, patients for, for um, almost um, all of the diseases or, or if i can say uh, statistically then uh, because we have collected all of the data uh, as i have I, i i started this as a research center so i have uh, maintained all of the data and the records uh, from the day one uh, till now so we we have uh, almost uh, patients for more than 250 diseases the patients who come to us they are, they come for for the treatment of more than 250 diseases which is uh, in our records so uh, every type of disease um, alhamdulillah benefits from hijama almost every type of disease like uh, from cancers and tumors there are the goals are different in some cases uh, the goal is remission sometimes the goal is um, uh, the palliative care sometimes the goal is supportive therapy sometimes we are countering the side effects of chemotherapy so in right. in different scenarios in different stages of the diseases in different diseases the goals are, uh, are different so but more the most common disorders for example uh, if i will i i would say uh, that that hijama is most effective in the treatment of uh, in which in which condition i i will say that it is the pain problems uh, all kinds of pain problems are alhamdulillah they are uh, treated uh, very effectively and very rapidly uh, including sciatica migraine cervical pains neuro neuronal pains like for example trigeminal neuralgia which is a neuronal pain which uh, occurs uh, on face on the cheeks um so uh, in the same way the pain for from arthritis um whether it is rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis all kinds of pains are alhamdulillah uh, they are treated and cured right. with that, the help of this is something a very good information because uh, in many of the cases we only go to the normal doctors or the allopathic doctors uh, for the um, for the treatment of arthritis because this is something very new to me as well because arthritis is being uh, uh, it's been very common these days particularly in pakistan um so i think that uh, if if you if you can highlight some of the cases uh, particularly yes. which uh, uh, in which people had been benefited through this. there are many i mean thousands of cases of right. course thousands of cases but i will uh, mention some of them uh, for example uh, there was a case of uh, avascular necrosis 
ए वी एन दिस इज़ अ डिजीज़ इन विच ब्लड सप्लाई इज़ रिड्यूसड और डिमिनिश टू द फीमर हेड फीमर इज़ द बोन इन अवर था एंड द हेड इज़ इन द हिप जॉइंट सो वैन ब्लड सर्कुलेशन स्टॉप्स टू द फीमर हेड दैन द फीमर हेड स्टार्ट्स रॉटिंग इन द ले मैन लैंग्वेज इट स्टार्ट्स डिसंटीग्रेटिंग सो देर इज़ नो अदर ऑप्शन दैन सर्जरी और रिप्लेसमेंट ऑफ द हिप जॉइंट बट अलहमदिल्ला वी हैव ट्रीटेड ऑलमोस्ट नॉट मैनी बट सम पेशेंट लाइक फोर और फाइव पेशेंट्स इन दीज ईयर्स आई हैव सीन बिकॉज इट्स नॉट अ वेरी कॉमन प्रॉब्लम दे अलहमदिल्ला गॉट क्योर्ड अलहमदिल्लाड कम्प्लीटली दिस इज समथिंग रियली अमेजिंग वन ऑफ दोज पेशेंट्स केम विद क्लचेज and okay. uh, alhamdulillah almost but although it took, it took some time like almost for uh, for a year i think he oh, okay came. one thing that i also want to know that um, I, i would like you to highlight about that how often one can go for sessions or what kind of the time frame should it be for example you said that um, uh, you you have previously mentioned that on on an average um each patient has uh, undergone 10 sessions so what what should be the gap between these sessions um uh, we have seen that three sessions are normally enough for some acute problem okay. and the the gap between these uh, three sessions should be one week okay one week so if a person uh, receives hijama therapy three times uh, once a week and this is something for for someone who doesn't have a very severe yeah. uh, um, uh, um, severe medical issues right. and this is something for uh, this is something you are highlighting for for average normal looking with a normal physique person who yes. has a normal blood ratio as well yes. for example if someone is coming with, to you with low rate of hemoglobin so mm-hmm. you won't recommend it for there that. is there is a range there is there is a limit like if the hemoglobin is below 7 then we don't perform hijama right. if if it is above 7 but it is uh, below 10 then still we perform hijama with caution with and uh, uh, while uh, observing the risk versus benefit ratio Okay. if the risk is uh, less than the benefit then we perform hijama otherwise not and uh, if the patient is uh, hemoglobin is uh, more than 12 or it's normal within normal range then it depends upon the needs of the patient the number of cups or the number of points at which we perform hijama uh, during a session is also uh, subjected to the pa- first of all the patient's need then the patient's capacity like um, how much points he can bear easily because um, some although the the amount of blood which is drawn uh, through hijama is very uh, small like uh, around 2 to 3 ml normally in one cup uh, and especially for the first time whenever we perform hijama for the first time the amount of blood is very less because there is stagnant blood beneath the skin it is not uh, easily flowing so it uh, it comes out very difficult uh, with very uh, much difficulty and it does not comes out easily and the blood is not flowing it's actually like we are pulling out some semi solid substance okay. so it's uh, something like that like jelly like substance is that it's and not considering uh, the fact that we are carrying such kind of the toxic elements within ourselves and we doesn't know about it for example you are highlighting that different kind of the substance when you are applying the hijama therapy so you sucked out some of different kind of the material out of the body uh, which which is toxic obviously and it is not highlighted by the uh, by the allopathic doctor obviously um, yes so how difficult it is to identify in a normal medicine rather than it is it has mm. been eliminated through uh, hijama actually uh, medicines uh, travel through our blood Yes. and they um, get to their site of action from uh, uh, through the blood if the blood circulates uh, to that part of the body then the the medicines will reach there otherwise medicines cannot reach uh, to their targets if the, if they are uh, uh, not being carried by the blood to that site of action because blood goes everywhere in our body so that is why there are medicines for every part of our body and they are working efficiently but uh, the blood which we are taking out through hijama is the that stagnant type of blood uh, where circulation is not reaching and the proof of this uh, hypothesis which you may say uh, um, say that it is a hypothesis and uh, what is the proof of this claim and the proof is that we have performed test of um, those some some patient i was 
when i was doing hijama in the in the um, early days i was actually doing for the uh, purpose of my phd and i was doing uh, patients for certain disorders in those disorders one of the condition was chronic renal failure that is the patients who are on dialysis who are, whose okay. kidneys are failed right and normally uh, the the parameter which is uh, used to evaluate the FE, uh, the efficiency of the kidney is creatinine creatinine yes, and creatinine. urea mostly yes. they are uh, checked and the normal range of creatinine is 0.9 or sometimes from 0.8 in some labs 0 from 0.6 the lower range and up to 1.2 this is uh, the normal range and if this uh, uh, if it is raised up to the level of 7 then it is supposed that the kidneys are failed and now the patient should have uh, should be on dialysis or uh, should have the kidneys transplanted so uh, this is the case of chronic renal failure and um, i uh, started this research uh, with the help of an ngo who were um, uh, and uh, who were uh, supplying the um free uh, dialysis service to uh, to the patients in the governments in government hospitals and uh, in one of the their hospital uh, the patients who were receiving the dialysis uh, i was uh, doing their hijama once a week with the uh, initially we had a meeting with their nephrologist who was in charge of their dialysis center and then after a long discussion he agreed very hesitantly because he um, he was responsible for the health of those patients and um, for their well being so he was not um, ready to take the risk so we started very cautiously and uh, i was although i was going from here gulshan agwal to orangi town near right. qatar hospital actually they were right. the patients of qatar hospital so uh, every week and i was only performing hijama on two points in the i think in the first session i performed on only on one point and in the second session i started from uh, two points because uh, they were very much uh, concerned that their hb is very low right because you know when kidneys are not functioning properly uh, erythropoietin which is a hormone uh, which is synthesized in the kidney uh, which is responsible for the for the um, rbc production is also uh, diminished so the patient has to be has to take uh, erythropoietin externally through the through injections oh, so i was actually mentioning this point because uh, we performed their creatinine level test Uh, uh in through the technique uh, th- uh, in uh, from the blood sample which which was drawn through the technique of hijama mm-hmm. and we compared it to the blood sample uh, which was obtained through their veins after the dialysis and you know that uh, after the dialysis the blood is uh, clean during dialysis the blood is clean from all of the impurities and from all of the toxic materials which is uh, normally uh, this process is normally done by the kidneys so uh, creatinine level is supposed to come uh, to come down to the to around the normal value because th- those patients were end stage renal failure patients so their creatinine levels were around 15 or 16 if oh if God. if their dialysis was not performed their their uh, creatinine would reach to these limits so but after It's dialysis very dangerous. yeah it is very, very they were dangerous. they uh, they could not urinate they, uh, uh, without the help of dialysis they could not uh, clean their blood i mean in, in the in a week they had to go through the procedure of dialysis three times so they were end stage renal failure patients and we started their hijama and then after some time i think around after one year i i i went there for two and a half years but i published my research paper after a year and this paper is published and available uh, on pubmed uh, so uh, we performed the test of creatinine uh in the blood which was taken out through the technique of hijama and the blood which was taken out uh, from vein, the, that the same, uh, same uh, the normal venous blood after the procedure of dialysis after the procedure of dialysis we performed hijama and we took both of the samples to a renowned lab i w- would not uh, name the laboratory right. but uh, it was a renowned uh, it is a renowned lab a very authentic one authentic lab yes uh, so uh, we got the results and the results were amazing and astonishing we saw that the blood which was taken out through the through normal procedure through normal veiny puncture that blood uh, the creatinine level in that blood was around 2 it was right. almost normal it is almost normal but the blood which we took from through hijama the creatinine level in that blood was around 15 or 16 okay so it so means that, that we, has actually taken out the toxins out of the body 
yeah and and we also concluded that dialysis uh, is being performed on the blood which is running through the blood circulation blood through the veins through the blood vessels right. but uh, it is not reaching up to uh, right. that point that to, it, to it, that level it, yeah me. where where we are taking out that blood uh, through the technique of hijama okay right so, so we, it was not actually uh, the normal allopathic procedure was mm-hmm. not targeting the whole of the body rather it was just covering obviously through the veins and that blood was clean but the rest of the body was uh, carrying the toxics yeah and we also concluded that the the blood which we draw through hijama is not the same as the blood which is uh, present in our circulation blood okay. circulation it is different it is something different it is these are the this is the debris of the blood which is uh, right. uh, because you know when blood is not in the circulation uh, and if it gets stuck somewhere then yes. it will it will die out the the cells will die out okay. because they will not uh, they receive oxygen themselves they right. will die out so it they they turn them, themselves in uh, into debris and uh, some toxins which are uh, accumulating in our bodies due to the unnatural lifestyle which we are living nowadays yes. so that's how, that's why okay i want to ask one more thing that are there any kind of the side effects of hijama and i also want to know that what kind of the potential risk um or or, or who should not go for because the this question is also linked with this uh, uh that uh, who who are the patients or who are the people who should not go for hijama are there some kind of the people that you had conducted the hijama and there comes up with side effects so obviously uh, your experience has uh, uh, is of many years almost more than a decade i guess yes so now uh, particularly i would say that for two decades you are conducting the hijama now so how you have eval uh, how much you have evaluated that what kind of the people um, are not suitable for hijama for example they they have the di- uh, diabetic or any kind of the issue they have and they should not go for the therapy or uh, uh, they they can only have one or two sessions they cannot attend more sessions is there some kind of restrictions for the uh, i would say that there is a very less number of people who cannot go through hijama and while most of the populations uh, like age wise or gender wise um, their health status wise or disease wise there are uh, almost all kinds of patients can go through hijama but there is there is a very small number of population it exists that uh, these people should not go for hijama or they should be they should uh, proceed cautiously after performing some tests so uh, first of all the population of um, in the case of females the pregnant ladies cannot go through hijama right. this is a contraindication a strict contraindication because it may lead to abortion so that is why uh, f- this is uh, one of the populations and then um, the people who are, who have hemophilia okay or bleeding disorders okay. some bleeding disorders they should not go through this procedure and the people who are receiving blood thinning drugs the okay. people who are receiving some heavy or some strong blood thinning drugs i uh, like escard or aspirin yes. or loprin is not very strong okay. these are not strong drugs but okay. clopidogrel is warfarin is very strong drug except is very strong drug and especially the patients after uh, having heart attack or some cardi- cardiac problem sometimes they receive an injection which is termed uh, known as clexane that injection is uh, given intraperitoneally in the in the area of abdomen so this injection um, uh, makes the blood very much thin and uh, after the after receiving this injection we recommend that patient should not go through hijama up to almost 2 months Okay. for uh, for up to 2 months almost so um and and some people who are uh, um, whose hemoglobin levels are very much low they are uh, anemic they yeah, are yes, you have, uh, or you may or you may say uh, thalassemic patients thalassemic Thal- but thalassemia major not thalassemia minor we we have performed hijama uh, on thalassemia minor also we have performed with caution on thalassemia major patients also the the goal was to uh, excrete out that iron which builds up after receiving uh, numerous transfusions which they receive on regular basis yeah. like uh, after th- every 3 months they are because the average life of rbcs is 3 months 
so uh, or four months so they receive around um, after every three months blood and the iron gets uh, accumulated in their bodies and it causes problems so these patients should uh, proceed uh, for hijama cautiously there are certain precautions which should be taken if these precautions are taken then mostly uh, there will be no problem and as you uh, mentioned age limits yes uh, our uh, youngest patient is around three months and oh. our oldest patient is 97 years old. Okay. So the range is very much wide. I mean, there is no limit, no age limit, right. at least no age limit. But these are some conditions which I have mentioned. The patient with diabetes, they have no problem in doing going through okay. hijama if, uh, if the procedure is performed correctly. Right. If there is some uh, deviation from the standards or the precautions, then there there might be some uh, some risks um, like um, healing problems, maybe delayed healing. But uh, in in order to avoid these conditions, we usually avoid uh, performing hijama on their feet because okay. mostly the the it, the it, it mm -hmm. get difficult to recover. Uh, yeah, sometimes because uh, we, you know that uh, diabetic foot is a common problem. Yes. yes. And the reason is um, diabetes, in, diabetes in those cases, uncontrolled diabetes. Right. Okay. Um. I as you have done hajama on multivariant patients, I would like you to highlight the current uh, lifestyles. Because I think that the current lifestyle is, for example, eating out and not having the healthy mechanisms or the healthy food and the healthy um, healthy lifestyle. And what I, I would say that uh, most of the people don't have time for a proper walk uh, or any kind of uh, or any kind of the exercise. So um, how would you consider that in such kind of situation or in such kind of uh, routine? Um, uh, uh, should we go or should everyone um, uh, I, I must ask you in this way that everyone should go for hijama because of they, because they are not having a healthy lifestyle so how would you suggest uh, you are correct about that uh, about the lifestyle and the unhealthy lifestyle which is prevalent nowadays and mostly we see that people are living unnatural lives yeah. they are uh, sleeping when they should be um, uh, waking yes. up and yes. they are exactly. wake, uh, awake when they should be sleeping right. so and they are eating junk food as, yes. um, um, while they should uh, eat healthy food or clean food. So uh, actually hijama cannot replace this bad lifestyle. Uh, and you will have to replace the bad habits. <laughs> and uh, I, I also promote the natural living. I also promote the organic living. I also uh, suggest my patients that if you want to keep away from us or keep away from the any from kind doctors. of health care and any kind any any health care provider, if you want to keep away from them then then uh, apple uh, used to be one of the those things which yes. uh, 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 eat an apple a day yeah yes eat an apple a day keeps the doctor away but yes. nowadays actually eating apple uh, f uh, is also lacking but still eating that apple on the correct time is also lacking they no, don't yes. know people don't know that when what what should they eat and when they should, when eat, they should eat and yeah. uh, how much to sleep and when to sleep because you know quality sleep time is also very important, very important. and uh, this is one of the uh, major reasons why our um, why the lives of people are nowadays suffering why th there are health issues why the hospitals are uh, filled with patients who are not getting sufficient care so the, the the main reason is that their lifestyle is not uh, according to the nature. It is not aligned with their nature. Right. Their circadian rhythms or their biological clocks are uh, manipulated and they are, uh, and they are not, not and on the correct time. Correct, correct yeah. time, particularly. Okay, so um, in the last, I want you to highlight about the prevailing health challenges, which is uh connecting to my last question um that what are the challenges that you might see uh, and what would be the challenges in our future so health challenges particularly the health challenges which i am seeing nowadays and for a i think that uh the post 
कोविड वर्ल्ड देर आर मैनी न्यू हेल्थ चैलेंजेस विच हैव इमर्ज और और इफ देवर इवन इफ देवर प्रेजेंट प्रीवियसली देन देयर रेशो हैज़ इंक्रीज ड्रामेटिकली एंड देयर आई मीन नंबर ऑफ सच केसेज हैव इंक्रीज रेपिडली टू अ मेगा स्केल बिकॉज द रीज़न इज़ दैट आई थिंक द द रीज़न बिहाइंड मोस्ट ऑफ द प्रीवेलिंग हेल्थ चैलेंजेस और कंडीशंस इज स्ट्रेस the the most prevalent um, challenge is nowadays is stress uh, in the in the olden days it was uh, said that uh, constipation is the mother of all diseases but nowadays i think father of all of the diseases is <laughs> yes, stress. stress because and be- every every person is in stress it's not just the adult but the children because of their schooling systems and yeah. the schooling mechanisms and through other problems they are also facing this stress problem yes and this stress actually uh, changes our blood chemistry it changes our Uh, all of the hormones and enzymes because it yeah. changes the uh, nervous system the autonomic nervous system which is controlling our body which right. is controlling our heartbeat and the release of blood uh, sugar levels the release of uh, insulin and the release of different enzymes which are uh, used for digesting our food so uh, all of these uh, these things are controlled by the autonomic nervous system or automatic nervous system which is uh, run through our uh, brain and spinal cord so these systems are uh, disturbed because we are in stress whenever we are in stress and uh, a stress hormone is released from our kidneys uh, over the kidneys there are adrenal glands they re- they secrete cortisol which is okay. a stress hormone yeah. and when it uh, it uh, reaches to the blood stream it triggers the autonomic nervous system uh, um, that part the which is termed as fight or flight mechanism that is the sympathetic nervous system it increases our blood circulation it increases our blood pressure it increases blood sugar level it reduces or it inhibits the digestive system and uh, the body is in a kind of emergency so uh, the the other system which counteracts it which relaxes us which reduces the blood pressure which reduces the blood sugar level which enhances our digestive system and it is termed as rest and digest system uh, th- that system is termed as uh, uh, parasympathetic nervous system and that parasympathetic nervous system is uh, dominant whenever we are sleeping at the right time so okay. if we are not sleeping at the right time we uh, uh, we are we are exhausting continuously exhausting and we are not getting replenished which uh, would be done uh, by the activation of parasympathetic nervous system sorry for the uh, the difficult type of, <laughs> of uh, <laughs> terminologies terminologies <laughs> no but, but that is something very um, very good to know and thank you so much dr bilal uh, for being with us because you have highlighted that many of the severe cases in which we think that a person we have lost a person for example once uh, a person is on dialysis particularly or having some kind of the very severe uh, problems and you have highlighted about some of the success cases that where uh, they have been treated through hijama and i think that uh, going towards some kind of uh, th- these kind of the therapies which doesn't have any side effects and particularly which does not having any kind of the medication because uh, because i have also witnessed these things that if you are getting any kind of the medication it also have the side effects so mm-hmm. the hijama um, out of your talk what uh, in a nutshell if i just uh, want to conclude it that uh, hijama is more successful and uh, it releases out the toxins out of your body which is very difficult in terms of uh, other med- medications um thank you so much for Most being welcome. with us with us um and uh, i'm ending the session here um uh, thank you dr bilal for being with you us and highlighting us about the importance and benefits of hijama jazakallah khair mashallah